Welcome to this Epic Life Podcast, where we'll get to know incredible leaders and creators by looking closely at how they live and how they contribute to the world we deserve. We'll also explore three powerful permissions with our guests. Number one, permission to chill. Number two, permission to feel all the feels or embrace your full humanity. And finally, three, permission to glow in the dark. Interpret that as you wish. I'll be your host. My name is Christopher Carter. My friends call me KC. I'm a coach for founders and executives and meditation teacher for organizations. Episode one, let's go. I'm excited to welcome our guest, Philip Goldberg, to the podcast. I first learned of his work when he was interviewed in the documentary film, Awake, about the life of Paramahansa Yogananda, that came out in 2014, and then I read his excellent book on the same subject, which came out last year in 2018. In full transparency, I'm not impartial whatsoever on the topic of Paramahansa Yogananda. I've been studying his teachings for seven years as a devotee and Kriyaban member of Self-Realization Fellowship. My life has been in a state of positive transformation since I first read Autobiography of a Yogi in 2011. Philip Goldberg has been studying India's spiritual traditions for more than 50 years. He is the author or co-author of over 20 books, including the award-winning American Veda, From Emerson and the Beatles to Yoga and Meditation, How Indian Spirituality Changed the West. His latest book, The Life of Yogananda, The Story of the Yogi Who Became the First Modern Guru, is the first full-scale biography of Paramahansa Yogananda. Philip is an ordained interfaith minister, spiritual counselor, and meditation teacher who is presented throughout the U.S. and India. You can find Philip online at philipgoldberg.com. That's Philip with one L. He blogs regularly on spirituality and health online at Elephant Journal, conducts tours of India with American Veda Tours, and co-hosts the popular Spirit Matters podcast. Mr. Goldberg, welcome to the show. Hey, Casey, nice to be with you. So where do we begin here? How about 50 years of studying India's spiritual traditions? Right, How- let's call attention to my age right off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an impressive number, no matter how you slice it. Um, <laughs> how did this journey begin for you? Well, I was raised by atheists, so I had no religious wow. or spiritual um, upbringing whatsoever. But uh, then came the 1960s, and I was a college student and uh, searching and seeking for answers to the uh, big important questions of life and trying to figure out what my place in the universe was and my, how to live a life very confused and uh, experimenting with different things. And largely when the, because of the Beatles going to India, but even beyond that, books were floating around among all of us seekers. And a lot of them were about uh, Zen and mysticism and the yoga tradition. And uh, I just got completely carried away and absorbed by all of those influences and uh, turned eastward where I found um, an acceptable understanding of spirituality that seemed to me very reasonable and non-dogmatic and um, very promising. So I experimented with various forms of meditation, became a teacher of transcendental meditation, uh, and to bring us back to the subject of uh, Yogananda, one of those many influences at that time was Autobiography of a Yogi. The two uh, answer a uh, question that you know, your listeners may have already uh, had. Uh, I never became a devotee of Yogananda's or a disciple, but just always, you know, since I first read the Autobiography of a Yogi in 1970, uh, I still have that very copy. And it's um, it and his other work have always been sources of wisdom and inspiration for me. So uh, he was not my guru as such, but one of what's called upagurus, you know, the, the many teachers that you learn from and an important one. 
Wow. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited to dig into how that relationship has developed over time between, you know, his, his influence and teachings on you as a young man and how it's made its way into so much of your writing. Uh, to borrow from your subtitle of your book, American Veda, how would you describe the work that your role plays in Eastern spirituality changing the West? Like either your work as a historian or as a documentarian of yoga, what, what would you say your role is? Um, I, I, I can't speak to how much uh, of an influence I've had or a mark that I've made. I'll let uh, other people <laughs> determine that. Sure. I just plug away because I think the, um, the introduction into American life, uh, Western life in general, and uh, the ease of access to uh, the Eastern spiritual traditions is one of the more important developments historically uh, in our cultural lives. It has affected uh, everything from psychology and medicine uh, to uh, how we perceive ourselves and the role of religion, the way we understand religion, the way we approach our own spiritual lives as a collective uh, matter to a much more profound level than people realize. And, and one of my, my sense of my own calling, which is why I wrote American Veda and essentially why I wrote, you know, the biography of Yogananda is to call attention to that and to um, in any way I can accelerate that process because I think it is terribly important. Yeah, I'm wondering what the West is giving India in return, other than maybe some McDonald's. Like, uh, um, yeah, there is that, but, <laughs> but there's also you know useful technologies. Like, sure. you know, it's easier to find uh, a good Wi-Fi connection than it is to find a flush toilet. Yeah. And you know, there would be no Bollywood if there was no Hollywood. Yeah. For good and bad, uh, cultures influence each other, and we take what is useful. And we have taken, to a much greater extent than people realize, we have taken what Americans have found useful in Indian philosophy and the methodologies of uh, the uh, sort of in inner technologies of uh, such as meditation and various uh, rep the repertoire of yoga. Yogananda's words was uh, the material efficiency of the West was what he was hoping would uh, help uplift the East, and it was the spiritual wisdom yes. and all that heritage in the East. And and that's how teachers from the East, uh, even before Yogananda and and since, perceived the sort of <laughs> the cultural exchange. Uh, you know, it's an oversimplified way of looking at things, but it's very true. You know, we had this advanced material culture and India needed, des you know, it still does, you know, input from the West in terms of modernizing its infrastructure and uh, economy. And, um, and so they borrowed, just as we borrowed, what um, their ancients discovered about the nature of the inner life and the nature of consciousness, the nature of the human spirit. And those things have proven very, very useful. What would you say are some of your primary practices? Um, and also, do you, do you consider studying, writing, and teaching part of your sadhana or spiritual discipline? Are you, are you still a meditator, still doing yoga? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Every day for since 1968. I, you know, spend some time in, in meditation, uh, depending on my schedule. And I have, uh, you know, built around my central form of meditation. Uh, I learned transcendental meditation back in 1968, became a teacher of it in 1970. Wow. And that became my, uh, the center of my sadhana. Uh, but I've added many other things as well, including things I've learned from Yogananda. So I have a repertoire, but, um, and, you know, that integrating, you know, my own spiritual development with my duties and responsibilities as a human being has been the uh, centerpiece of my life's priorities, and it's a work in progress. 
Sure. <laughs> so I continue yeah. that effort and do my best to help others do it you know, to, by sharing what I've learned. You could tell somebody that's meditated for so many years because they are just completely humbled by the process of it, you know, that the work, the work continues indefinitely. 20 books written or co-authored out of all the books you've either written or come into contact with, if you could go back and you know, introduce your younger self to just a few cornerstone books, what do you think have been the most influential? From my uh, collection, the ones I was involved with? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, if, because other, if otherwise you're opening up a vast universe of books, most of many of which are superior to my own, <laughs> but of, of the things I wrote and co-wrote, well, you know, I, I should uh, just say that uh, there's a, a lot of variety in my books. They don't all address spiritual subjects. I, did. I would say the two books you mentioned, American Veda and The Life of Yogananda, Prior to that was a book, I think, you know, if I, I hate to sound uh, non-humble, but I think is a very useful book for people on the spiritual path. It's called Road Signs on the Spiritual Path, Living at the Heart of Paradox. Mm -hmm. And years ago, I wrote a book called The Intuitive Edge, which is about uh, understanding and cultivating intuition um, that sort of was one of the first books on that subject. So if you, if you had to pick from the entire spiritual canon, from the Bhagavad Gita up through autobiography, anything in between, like, are there any that just really stand out for you? Yeah, that you consider I, I'm scripture? A, uh, the, the book that probably uh, has influenced me more than any, and, and there are, you know, I, there's a, a, a list of, you know, 10 or 12 books that really had a big impact on my life, including Autobiography of Yogi. But the Bhagavad Gita has become, if you know, the, the sort of literary centerpiece, the one I return to, the one I've read, you know, I have. I'm looking at, you know, 10 or 15 tra different translations and commentaries of it as I speak. I write about it. I speak about it. It's the sort of uh, touchstone for me of sacred literature. It has more. It, uh, it contains... Uh, so much in uh, in a very concise place that to me it uh, you know it, it it stands out among the world's uh, sacred texts. The Gita you know serves me very well. Where does uh, Yogananda's God talks to Arjuna commentaries on the Gita fall into your? It's the longest. He, it's definitely the, the longest, yeah. It's a remarkable uh, collection uh, or translation and commentary. And the, a lot of the credit, of course, goes not just to Yogananda, of course, who gets you know, the, all, almost all the credit, but to his uh, disciples who sure. assembled, assembled those two volumes uh, after his passing from everything he had written and spoken about the Gita over his you know, 32 years here in, in the West. And, and so uh, it's a standout translation and commentary. But, you know, to me, I, I always advocate for anybody serious about the Gita is uh, um, look at a few different translations and a few different commentaries because one of the great things about uh, that yogic tradition is uh, – Everybody recognizes that treasures like the, 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 the Gita, the Yoga Sutras, the Upanishads, they are subject to interpretation. They, they, have, they were written by individuals of exalted states of consciousness. Right. And so um, it behooves us to not be arrogant about any single translation or commentary. Uh, and because, you know, people have different perspectives on. And uh, so I always compare when I, you know, go to a verse uh, or a chapter of the Gita and I say, how did this person translate it? How did Yogananda translate it? How did Swami so-and-so translate it? And, and out of that, I get a, a sense of, you know, uh, for better or worse, you know, what makes sense to me. Yeah. No, that's a great process. I'm, I'm going to reach out to you separately to get your, your list of recommended uh, <laughs> commentaries on the Gita. Okay. One of the things I was really struck by in your biography of Yogananda was just how exhaustive your research is. 
And I was curious about what your process is and are you still researching the subject as you're completing the work or do you, do you knock it out in separate phases? Do you get all the research Well, done? you know, that's a very interesting question. The second part of that, uh, it is, it was exhaustive as was American Veda. Uh, yeah. Both, yeah, both right. required a tremendous amount of research and you know, there, there's overlap because a lot of the history I uncovered in American Veda helped me inform the, the historical periods I cover in the Yogananda book. And I have a chapter on Yogananda in American Veda, and it was in writing that chapter that I realized how interesting his story was, his yeah, yeah. human story, and inspired me to go deeper into it, you know, to, to, to write a full book about it rather than the, the limited chapter I have. But it's, it's, a, it's an iterative process. You know, I did a lot of research in both cases. I did a lot of research and at a certain point he said, hey, you know what? You have a deadline. If you, you can keep <laughs> yeah, researching, yeah. you can research this for the next 10 years, but at some point you have to start writing. So at a certain point you say, okay, I've got enough to get going. And I start writing and I start writing. And then the process of writing, you re- you, that process reveals what you uh, still need to find out. You know, you, sure. you realize, oh, look, this, is ta- this line of thought has taken me in this direction. Now I'm up against uh, a crossroads and I need to know this or that. So you then take some time. And so the writing process overlaps with ongoing research you discover new things you uh, you realize what is missing and you go have to go find it meanwhile you're continuing to make progress uh using what you know and so in the case of the ogananda book um i wrote as much as i could about his early life i wrote it chronologically the book follows his life chronologically uh, and I was writing those chapters while I was gathering material for you know, the later years of his life, for which there was a lot more material than there was about his early life. So um, it's an ongoing thing. And then after you have a first draft, you realize in getting feedback and reading it yourself that, oh, you know, there's something missing here and that I didn't think of asking this question. So you better go find out and, you know, that sort of thing. One of the things I was, I was present to is that, you know, it, it's, is you're covering the life of, of one human being, uh, in this case, a divinely inspired uh, human being, certainly. But in some ways, it was kind of a continuation of your work in American Veda and that you're kind of simultaneously covering the larger trend of, of yoga coming to the West because his, his life was representative of that whole movement. That's how did quite you, right. How does your relationship to to a subject like Yogananda or just American Veda, how does your subject how does your relationship to your subject evolve as you work up through the release date? Because I'm sure you you fall in and out of love with it just because how how big it is or you don't I I have never fallen out of love with it. I have gotten uh, exhausted and impatient with <laughs> yeah, the yeah. with the process of fact checking and tracking down information. I mean, there were things, for example, about Yogananda's life that, you know, we don't know. And I, I was yeah. hoping to find out, you know, some of it was easy to find out. And others was like, you know, I had to go to government archives and things like that, you know, so uh, look in old newspapers and hope for the best. And so, you know, you, you dig and dig and dig, and sometimes it's frustrating because, you know, some things will remain a mystery, just that there's no evidence for this or that or no documentation. Um, and so you do your best and you, you proceed. And, um, but I've never lost interest in the overall subject at all because it, it's, um, yeah. I think, endlessly fascinating. And very important to me personally, it's been, you know, it's, it's been so important in my own life mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, it's an on, ongoing discovery. And I love, you know, historical stuff. I mean, one of the things I hope I brought to the book, uh, to Yogananda's biography that hadn't been there before is historical context. Yes. Uh, you know, devotees, for example, know of, you know, the years, his teenage years, you know, they know something about his teenage years in uh, what was then called Calcutta. 
Uh, many have taken pilgrimages, like I bring uh, uh, tour groups uh, to India. And uh, when we're in, in Kolkata, we go to his, the home he lived in, you know, places he went to and all that. And people have done that. But I went a little further and wrote a lot about what Calcutta was like in those years and right. what it was like culturally and the historical significance and the influences that must have helped to shape Yogananda. Yeah, one of my favorite parts in the book was when you shared a, um, it was so timely and relevant because our political culture here is so fractured at the moment in the West. And um, it was a letter to the editor that Yogananda had written after he was banned from speaking somewhere in the South, maybe in Florida. But it was the letter to the editor he wrote about women in Kashmir. Does this ring a bell for you? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, the, the, there was a mention of the women uh, from Kashmir. Yes, in it because <laughs> well, he was tr- he was trying to debunk, as I recall, like he was trying to debunk the you know the that kind of blanket fear that this brown skinned Swami was going to come and hypnotize all the white women and you know form a sex cult. He said if if I was interested in doing that, I would go to Kashmir, where actually the Caucasian women are much more attractive and much more spiritually oriented. And I just I really got his humor in that. I just got so much love and humor from that. And you could tell it was a very intense period of his life too. The letter is great, and discovering things like that is also great. I when you mentioned letter, I thought you were going to talk about the letter that was published in the New York Times about advocating that Indians be allowed to become citizens of the U.S. There were big changes in immigration laws that uh, during the span of his life. But that one, too, you know, was excellent. And you're right. And that part stood out. You know, he was a Swami. So but people um, and it wasn't just him. We should notice this from a historical point of view. Even before he came to America in 1920, there was this fear that uh, the few swamis who would come and go and some who settled here were hypnotizing American women and essentially to have their way with them. And they were uh, despoiling American womanhood. And there was this fear of you know, the dark-skinned, virile male having a bad uh, untoward influence on innocent American women. And and the ones from India, these yogis had hypnotic powers and all this. I mean, it was a lot of that. And so he fell prey to it, uh, particularly in uh, when he visited Miami, which was, you know, really part of the deep South at that time. And he ran into not only that kind of sexualized paranoia, but just blatant racism you know yeah. uh, and and you know this was in the 1920s when uh you know we think we america has a racist streak now well it was a whole lot worse back then yeah. i tried to include things like that letter to show the human side and also one other thing i i've been giving talks lately called life lessons from the life of yogananda and one of the things I think is important for people who have a spiritual life to uh, appreciate uh, and learn from his life is that, you know, he was a renunciate. He took vows as a Swami, but he, he not only was a Swami in the world, working very hard and building an organization and having a, a, an important mission to fulfill, but he was an engaged person. He spoke out about injustices and political uh, things going on right. and world events, uh, you know, and spoke out as, as a great advocate of the Gandhi and the Indian uh, independence movement. And as a non-citizen at the time, as a subject of the British Empire, uh, that put him at a certain amount of risk. Um, but he did it. And I, I think that's uh, one of the more admirable things we can you know, take away from his life. Autobiography of a Yogi widely considered a spiritual classic, probably one of the most epic autobiographies ever written, just in its depth and just volume of subjects it covers. What were your challenges in approaching an objective account of Yogananda? Anytime you try to be uh, historically accurate, and especially when you're talking about the lives of people who uh, are revered, and in many cases worshipped, 
Uh, you have to tread carefully, but my main um, loyalty was to the facts. And so I, I tried to be as uh, honest and uh, accurate as I could, given the limitations of you know what you can find about somebody who's been gone for more than 60 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there are choices to be made, what you include, what you don't, because you have limited space. You know, you, I didn't have a thousand pages to, to cover you know, everything about about his life and all the implications. So that, that was really the challenge. But I was very conscious of the fact that Yogananda is revered uh, by millions of people, many of whom will, were bound to read every, you know, whatever I write, find fault with it, or think I didn't really get how great Yogananda was, or why did I write about this part of his life and not that part of his life? But that's to be uh, expected. And uh, it's, it's, in fact, what happened. The other aspect of it is there were people, and there have been, who have, for whatever reason, decided all gurus are frauds, or Yogananda was not what he was cracked up to be, uh, and they'll think I was too worshipful. So, yeah. So... I get people who think I didn't treat him with the reverence he deserves and people who think I was too reverent. And I, I, I knew that would happen because in American Veda, I had written about all the gurus who came here, and that's what I got. But for the most part, I think as long as I'm getting uh, criticism f- by people uh, on both sides, I think I did a fair job. Well, I think you're bound to butt up against you know, people's interpretations of a saint or a divine being or, or just maybe something they've never seen or experienced before, like a, you know, a foreign Swami coming to American shores. It's through that lens of human projection and delusion that, um, you know, a lot of those, you know, fears or criticisms or, you know, determination to find anything wrong. I mean, with from Mother Teresa to Gandhi to Yogananda, I mean. People love to place spiritual uh, luminaries on pedestals and other people like to tear down the pedestals. I love that uh, Brother Chidananda was interviewed for the book, who's the current uh, president of Self-Realization Fellowship, which is Yogananda's organization. Did you get together in person with him to, for the interview, or was that correspondence? Many times, oh, and uh, he, he was wonderful. His, his knowledge is encyclopedic, and right. he recognized that um, my intentions were good, and that I was determined to be fair and respectful. At the time, this was before he was named president, mm-hmm. uh, was essentially the keeper of the archive and was a primary source of information for me. And, you know, he gave me feedback on early drafts and uh, oh, wow. pointed, out, pointed out mistakes. And, uh, and we had a lot of conversations. So I, I deeply appreciate that. I've met him twice at convocation and, uh, once randomly up at, uh, Mount Washington, which is the headquarters. And this is, this was also before he was named president. I've heard some extraordinary stories about brother Chidananda speaking, uh, while in India where the, where everyone felt unquestionably that Yogananda was present there, whether it was through him or just there. I mean, it's, it's a, a very real, real feeling. Did you um, sense Chidananda's uh, being and personality? I mean, he's a genuinely joyful guy, right? You know, I have been around uh, a lot of swamis, a lot of uh, monastics from all the different lineages, Indians and Westerners who have uh, become lifelong devotees and Men, you know, who have taken monastic vows and who's, you know, 100% devoted to their spiritual life and to service uh, through their own, whatever lineage they're from. And I have great respect for all of them. Every once in a while, you run into somebody and you think, Oh God, who made this guy? You know? <laughs> he did the he did the weekend course, like the weekend course on Swami. Hood. Whatever you you know you yeah you run into people who don't quite live up to you know the the uh, stature that is um, attributed to them, but most do, and um, I have tremendous respect for those people. And in the case of Chidananda, you know he has a great presence. And he um, is, you know, deeply, deeply devoted and sincere. And I 
completely respected that. My job, you know, entailed, you know, pushing certain boundaries and, you know, having candid conversations. Well, you know, I found out this or I learned that or I heard about this and, and you know, what, how would you respond to that? And what evidence is there? And can you show me? I can't just take your word for it. Do you have any documentation? Sure, right. right. So I had to, I had to push him, and he had to push me, and it was done with tr- mutual respect. I have nothing but respect for him, and it would not surprise me. I have not seen him since he became president, except uh, in the public setting of you know where he gave talks. But it would not shock me that when that kind of status and that kind of responsibility is bestowed on a disciple, that something, uh, uh, another magnitude mm-hmm. of uh, presence and uh, something special uh, comes over them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I would love to, you know, run into him and have a cup of tea with him as I, I did when before he was president yeah. and, and, and see what that's like. But it, would, it does not shock me. that His, um, his talk that he gave at Marina Linimata's um, memorial service at convocation. I was, was just, there. Oh, oh, you were. Okay, you were there. So, so 2017. It was terrific. But when he, when he was talking about entering her quarters – numerous times as as she was making her transition and and experiencing the different levels of power. Like at one point it felt like she was grinding through the karma of thousands of souls. It just, it was just like unshakable. There's this immense power that almost pushed him out of the room and other times would be just total peace. Just, just the receptivity and the love between all those disciples is pretty, pretty extraordinary, but I, I loved that he was involved in the book. And in, in general, um, it seemed that SRF was supportive uh, of the account of their guru was, did you run into any uh, resistance from the organization? N- not from the organization, but from the dis- disciples. <laughs> Sometimes the disciples can be more uh, sure. Protective too rigid or... than, than the leadership, the leadership. I, you know, I retain a lot of mutual respect and affection with the the leaders. I was in India in October and uh, met with some of the Indian swamis and I took my tour group to the ashrams and everybody uh, respected the final product and appreciated the fact that I had a different job than a disciple. So th- I'm so glad you're bringing this up, Phil, because it, my, my local circle, the closest temple to me is about 50 miles away here in Northeast Ohio. It's a Cleveland meditation circle for self-realization fellowship. And when I got your book in April, I believe it came out in April, correct? Yes. I was, yeah. Yeah. So I was so excited. I took it to um, the temple on, um, on a Sunday and, and I just said, oh, I'm so excited. I'm reading this. As soon as I'm done with it, I'll let you, I'll let you borrow it. And it was an interesting reaction. So some people, of course, everybody's immensely curious. Oh my gosh, the American years? Like there was so little said about the American years in autobiography. But then other people, there was just like this kind of divisive feel to it. And a longtime devotee, uh, a, a great friend of mine, a longtime devotee on the path, she, she did read your book entirely and she, she absolutely loved it. She, she was more hesitant to, to get into it. And she did say she loved it overall. And she said, you know, it just, it's unfortunate that, they, that people even have to bring up those, what people labeled as scandals or, uh, you know, the racism and like some, some of the darker times of his life because he was, you know, Yogananda was a human being and he had to go through all of that experience. You know, even avatars aren't spared that human experience. And, um, and I said, uh, I, I just appreciated the care that you gave to show all evidence and to leave it up to the, to the uh, reader to decide. You know, and I'm glad you bring this up because from the beginning, not just Chidananda, but the others, you know, seniors, swamis and monastics, the public relations people and all that, they understood my, my sure. responsibility as a objective writer. And they recognized that there would be value to Yogananda's legacy and their own mission to have somebody outside. And so their participation was partly to ensure that I maintained an accurate and respectful uh, presentation. And they trusted me because I've already proven 
that I, I could be trusted by in how I wrote about Yogananda prior to this and how I, yeah, I was on film in, a, in the movie that you mentioned. In yeah. Wake. And so there was a mutual respect at the same time, you know, they had their concerns because I am an outsider. So, but within spiritual organizations, among disciples and devotees, there's often, a, you know, an attitude that, oh, you know, this, he's not a disciple. This isn't, you know, an approved, this isn't a, an official publication. Maybe it's, it's, you know, we shouldn't read this. But the officials, the, the, the people who run SRF, they don't feel that way. <laughs> you yeah. know, they well, I, felt I, that, you know, the more information, the better. So. It says a lot about how they approached, uh, how they searched maybe for years to find the right uh, producers for the film before selecting the film. And, and they, they selected them based on it being, you know, a truly objective outside account. That's what they wanted it to be because it would have more validity in the wider market. So if people open up Netflix, it would be a totally different experience if it said, you know, produced by SRF as if it was an infomercial for Yogananda's teachings. What I remember about the, the Counterpoint Films crew uh, who made Awake was that they had a lot of auspicious, miraculous experiences producing that film. And ultimately, I, I don't know if they became formal students, but I know they studied the teachings. Some of them did. There was, you know, one didn't, the other two did. Sure. They were hired, they were outsiders, and, you know, SRF's participation in Awake was different from their participation in my book. Sure. Uh, where I had the final say about things. And, but, you know, I, I, I worked with them. Um, but it was to their credit that they hired the filmmakers outside of the organization to produce it and direct it. And it's to their credit that they uh, cooperated with me. And, uh, they, and, and it was not just the right thing to do, it was a smart thing to do. By cooperating with yeah. me, they could have input and you know, ensure accuracy that you know, without that, I would have made a lot more mistakes. Yeah, no, it's great. It sounds like a great partnership that you had. And, uh... I'm sure you both sides learned a lot from each other through the process. Yeah, it was very satisfying to come up with information that even Chidananda didn't know. What's so incredible as a devotee on the path is that you hear stories about Yogananda, like really personal, intimate stories, like little passing stories from, you know, the, the, just the handful of, of monastics that still might be alive that, that knew him while he was in the body. If not, yes. they were just uh, passed down from, you know, monk to monk or nun to nun. But right. some of these stories are so astonishing and they just don't exist in any book. And I feel that it's kind of the guru, you know, just giving the devotee just a little bit more of a glimpse when they're ready for it. Those stories, it seems to be there's a never ending well, yeah, and I, I kept, and, and one of the criticisms I've gotten from disciples is there wasn't enough of that, you know, in truth, you know, I, I just didn't want it to be that kind of one lovable thing after another. Um, and I didn't want, you have to make choices in a, a book like this, you know, I'm limited to around 300 pages, and you have to make choices. So I, a lot of that kind of thing is, is has already been published, and I drew on published material from, you know, memoirs written by direct disciples of Yogananda sure. and all that, and they, they exist. So I didn't want to replicate too much of that. I wanted to give preference to things I was, I was able to find that have not already been published. So I used that material selectively. Do you mind if I share a quick little story I heard at Encinitas that blew my mind? That's Please. still one of my favorite um, Yogananda stories. Sure. So this is not in the autobiography of a yogi, but autobiography of a yogi was largely written at the Hermitage in Encinitas. And one of the things that Yogananda always regretted was that his master, Sri Yukteswar, was never able to see that hermitage with his own eyes. Have you heard this story? I think so, but go on. Okay. So uh, the, the first time I was, um, I toured the grounds there, um, I was let in on an off day just by random coincidence. And, uh, the nun there told me the story and we were standing up on the bluff behind the house, uh, looking out into the ocean and just breathtaking beauty. And she said, so master Yogananda would sit out here on this back patio and just look into the ocean a little bit forlorn, 
regretful that his his master couldn't uh, view this sacred place. And it was because it was kind of the fulfilling of a lot of prophecies that he he saw visions since high, uh, since childhood of of owning this sea, uh, seaside hermitage, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden the the material form of Yukteswar materialized out of the water, walked up the steps into the yard. <laughs> did did you have you heard this story? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, as I recall, the, the the message from Yukteswar was, "Now, do you believe that I'm seeing it with my own eyes? Are you, <laughs> you know?" <laughs> It was just this moment of of just you know total acknowledgement from master to disciple over of what he had created and you know that that, right. um, that they could transfer their consciousness in that way. I just thought it was it was kind of a cool little um, yeah. Addendum and there are many stories argument. like that. And I have to say that um, some people will just take that story as truth. Other people will say he, he Sounds was crazy. delusional and yeah, made yeah, it up yeah. or it was just as... Or, or I'm crazy. And my, yeah, and my, my take on my you know, sort of position as a writer, not just about stories like that, but all the miraculous stuff and autobiography of a yogi and other stories that he would tell throughout his life. You know, there's a lot of people read the autobiography of a yogi and they just love all those stories of the miraculous and other people don't right. They're put off by it, but they love the rest of the stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> the, you know, the, the human story, the rest, you know, I mean, I wrote my biography partly because I was aware of how much he left out of autobiography of a yogi, especially about the, you know, his life after he came to America. Um, so I felt, you know, there was, new things to be said. But about the miraculous, my role is just to say this is what he said. And yeah. I, my personal feeling is these things are possible. All things are possible to, to highly evolved souls, but I can't vouch for any of it. I'm not, uh, I'm not in a position uh, either as a, a fact-finding author or as a yogi <laughs> to to know what's true and what's not. I, I, I've given autobiography out so many times now, and what, what I, my my recommendation for everybody is to just read it at face value. Just suspend all disbelief. Just read it as if it's an epic, great book about amazing stories, you know. Mm-hmm. And also, I say it it really takes off after he meets his guru. I love your commentary in, in the in the biography where you say, you know, some of the criticisms early on, if if there were, and there weren't many compared to the reception. The reception's always been highly positive, but um, the uh, the criticism on uh, you know the flowery old timey language that was yeah. used. I love the stories from Convocation when Shinadanda was honoring Marinalini Mata when he was sharing those notes that that Yogananda would pass young. Myrna Brown, who became mm-hmm. Marina Lini Mata, and he would try out new words on her. He would specifically use all these big, giant English words because he was just so fascinated with English language. Do you remember this? It was yeah. during, and so the the word that tends to get most people out of the autobiography, if they remember any word, a uh, single word, is the word ejaculatory. <laughs> so, yes, I know, right? I know enthusiastic ej- ejaculations, whatever. And there's like so so many. Uh, you know, uh, blushed faces thinking of, you know, a guru using these words. And, but you got to think about the time that he was writing this in the forties, you know, that ejaculations were genuine, you know, explosions of glee, maybe. You know? Yeah. Or, uh, excla- exclamate verbal exclamations, uh, right. could be referred to that way. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of that. And one of my sources said, you know, that a, uh, he was not only it was not only a personal personality trait of his to you know to be very florid and and uh, dramatic in his expressions uh, uh, and uh, sometimes when you hear his uh, the recordings of him speaking he sure. sounds like a, an old time orator's preacher mm-hmm. but I somebody said that uh, you know he was Bengali from the Bengal section of India and in Bengali that kind of prose is fairly typical of the Bengali literature of that time. Mm. Right, you know, there's always a nu- nuance and and context, and also, these. you know, from Brahmin class, you know, a huge fan of Rabindranath Rabind- Rabind- Tagore, you know, just I I could totally see all of those influences come into, yeah, his command of English, and and then it's like getting into the music and the poetry and the chants yeah. and the writing, like there's so much depth to all of that. 
Yeah. As, as we kind of come full circle here, I love the conversation around you know trying to give an objective account of a potentially divine avatar or a, or a divine incarnation. How do you define you know, avatar of God or divine incarnation, since you study so much yoga. What, what's your definition of that? Avatar has a meaning in India, uh, in the Hindu tradition, of uh, a divine incarnation, a sort of representative of God on earth, one who comes here as a, a, a divine incarnation with a, a mission to accomplish, uh, to set the world straight at a time when it has strayed from the truth to, to deliver that. That's the classic definition. And an avatar would be perceived in a way that a, just, you know, a, a great guru uh, who evolved into or an enlightened guru uh, would be. It's a different level of status and stature. And, and, you know, Krishna's an avatar, Rama's an avatar. In some circles, Buddha was considered an avatar. Whether Yogananda was an avatar, I am not in a position to say. You know, a lot of disciples just take for granted that he was. I don't know. I don't know that anybody can know. It is just beyond my uh, consciousness to have a position on that. To me, it doesn't matter whether he was just a, a great popular uh, teacher who had a big impact on the world as a, a skillful teacher and one with a great mission to accomplish, or he was an avatar sent from God, or, you know, I, it doesn't matter. What he accomplished and what he taught is what really matters. And in my job in uh, telling the story was to focus on the humanity of the person, of Yogananda, and you know, how did this little, this child born Mukundalal Ghosh in 1893 become Paramahansa Yogananda, the author of the, the autobiography of a yogi who influenced millions and millions of lives? That was my job. So, whether he was a divine incarnation or a, just a highly evolved soul who continued to evolve and grow as a human being and became a great teacher, my job was to show that not to have an opinion on whether or not he was an avatar. So if at some point it is decided that Philip Goldberg is an avatar of God, you'd be able to call it then at that point from that consciousness, perhaps? I would. Well, that one would be very easy to refute. <laughs> and I'd be the first to say, please, you know, do not, you know, that would be way beyond. And I don't think I'm in danger of being called an avatar. Okay. <laughs> As it's we, hard enough when people in India think I'm a professor, you know. And <laughs> yeah, you know, I got I got into a, a, a fun little uh, reading exercise as I was looking through some of the, you know, very long, very well thought out comments from Indian readers on some of your um, talks on YouTube, you know, oh, just yeah. disputes over, you know, I, maybe they didn't know that what you shared uh, early on in our conversation about you being raised in an atheist household, but I think they were projecting <laughs> who's this guy Goldberg, this Jewish yeah. guy telling us that, you know, Jesus should be part of every Hindu tradition. Now all of a sudden, like he knows something and, and almost the, the assumption was that you had an agenda to get Christ onto every altar. And in you know, I've heard that and it's just hysterical, <laughs> you know, you know, like I've suddenly, you know, I'm part of the, you know, Christian missionary project to convert in. I mean, where did that come from? You know, it's like of all, things if they only you know if they were american they'd recognize my name as not christian <laughs> but yeah. well i uh, it's very strange I, i'm certainly grateful that you didn't honor your parents atheist tradition and you found your own <laughs> uh, well i found it very uh, you know i we don't have time for all this but coming from an atheist tradition when i discovered the indian spiritual teachings i had to unlearn something different from what people raised in, or in, in conventional religious households. They had to unlearn in a different way. And in many respects, it was harder for them. Yeah. I wow. was raised to question stuff. And I find that questioning and exploration and not settling for dogma 
was very much what appealed to me about uh, the Hindu and Buddhist traditions. Yes. Uh, and, and, that, and I'm still that way, I believe, you know, in asking hard questions and challenging assumptions and all that. And that's always been welcome in uh, the traditions of the East. Right. Yeah. The scientific direct experience of a relationship with God or the divine mm-hmm. versus right. the, listening to somebody talk about it. Uh, so as we wrap up, um, in, in my work, this epic life, we explore this idea of these three permissions and these three permissions are access to our highest expression. So the, the three permissions are as follows. They are permission to chill, which is to find stillness. <laughs> permission to feel all the feels, which is access to our full humanity and permission to glow in the dark. And you could interpret that however (laughs) you wish. Um, Maybe in the, maybe in the sixties, you would interpret that entirely different than you would today. But do, do any of these (laughs) resonate? (laughs) Well, let's not go there. As I would in college, I went to Kent state university. So of course that would be a totally different. There was a legacy there. There was, yes. It's right up the road here. But do, do any of these resonate for you today? Or could you use either the permission to chill, feel the feels or glow in the dark? Which of those resonates most with you and why? Well, I think they work together, you know, and we should all, I I like those. Um, And they're very consistent with, uh, you know, what Yogananda taught, what all the gurus of India taught, what I teach in my own limited way. This is, you know, stillness is to me the foundation of uh, the the dynamic aspect of life. And so that's why, you know, I meditate every day. That's why I advocate everybody should have a, a practice of going deep within this is the essence of the bhagavad gita yeah. find that you know unity find the silence within you and then act in the world um and so it's good to me that in your three you, you start with that what was the feeling of all the feelings now that's a, a subtle one because a lot of people get on the spiritual path and they think you know they try to do uh, uh extinguish feelings and, and feeling, you know, that having uh, emotions. Present, present company included. That's my big yes. exploration. Yeah. Me too. And, and that's a mistake because, right. you know, our humanness is, you know, includes the emotional dimension of life and the feelings of life and, you know, repressing them and suppressing them uh, is not going to advance your spirituality. And Yogananda is a good example of that. Uh, It's one of the things I I respected so much about him as a human being was, you know, sometimes he got angry. Sometimes he was upset by things. He was, you know, and he expressed it. We also have positive emotions and the full range of feeling is part of our curriculum. Experiencing them, dealing with them, learning from them is part of our spiritual curriculum and glowing in the dark. I like the way, you know, that's a good thing. But, you know, in attempting to glow in the dark, we should not ignore the fact that it's dark. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that, you know, being looking at, you know, what's been called the shadow side of our own lives and, you know, and and being willing, you know, it's one thing to say, Oh, I'm spiritual. I, I look at the positive side of life. Yes. But if you do that at the expense of, you know, ignoring or denying, the, the dark side, the challenges of life, both from your own life and, and the, the world as a whole, then uh, you don't have the capacity to act appropriately to bring the glow into the dark. Mm-hmm. As, as, you know, one of the things I admired about Yogananda, to bring it back to him, is he called that stuff out in his speeches and his yes. public writings. You know, he had a lot to say about, you know, don't forget, you know, he was here. Well, this is one of the great things about writing his life. His time in America included the Roaring Twenties, the Great Depression, I know. the buildup to World War II, right. the post-war years, the atomic age. And he, ha- you know, and, and uh, racism and Nazis and, you know, all kinds of stuff. And, and the liberation of his own country from British rule. All this mattered to him, and he addressed those things. And that's to, you know, so we should glow, but, you know, <laughs> not, not lose sight of the uh, darkness as well. Well, uh, the one thing I wanted to acknowledge you for, just on a personal level, I, I just want to thank you for bringing so much of his beautiful humanity into the dialogue. 
the uh, Marina Linimata, the president before Chidananda, she said uh, in an earlier talk, maybe even from the 70s, or no, maybe it was Dayama said this. She said, there's a tendency of devotees to dehumanize master. That's uh, right. I, and I thought that you brought such a, a beautiful humanity um, to give us, you know, to help us fill in some gaps and to create a fuller picture of what it was like to know him as a person. So I want to thank you for all your hard work and research on creating that for us. And, um, and also thank you. Thank for just, you for saying that. I appreciate it a lot. It's, it's a pleasure. I, I just really appreciate the levels of thought you brought to it. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And if you had one action that you would appreciate our listeners taking, either looking up the book or checking out your Veda tour or your American Veda tours, what, what, what would you uh, recommend that my uh, audience does? The best, go to philipgoldberg.com and you'll learn more about me and the various things I'm doing and stuff I'm interested in. And you can, uh, there are links there to, you know, get the book or any other of my books and learn about my tours and, and go to spiritmatterstalk.com uh, where I, that's the website for my podcast. There's a lot of interesting people there. And for your uh, fellow Yogananda devotees, you should know that, um, when the book came out last April, we did four different shows about Yogananda, um, and one of which is my co-host interviewing me. <laughs> but the other yeah. three are from uh, disciples, including Roy Eugene Davis, who's one yes. of the few remaining direct disciples. Well, thanks again for your time, Phil. I, I really appreciate everything, and uh, it's been a great conversation. Thank you very much for having me. And thanks to all of you for spending time with us. To learn more about anything we discussed today, please head on over to thisepiclife.com for all show notes. We'd really appreciate a review on iTunes and your feedback is always helpful. So please pop on over to iTunes and leave a review. And also, please get in touch. My email is kc at thisepiclife.com. You could also find us on Facebook and Twitter at This Epic Life. <laughs>